back and it's a pleasure to be speaking to this audience. It's great to see so many people. Thanks for coming. So um, I'll, um, I guess uh, many people, most people have in this room have uh, their own uh, idea <coughs> about CFTs and which comes from their research perspective. There are several ways to think about CFTs. <coughs> So for me personally, the, um, like the zeroth approximation way to think about, ah, and by the way, this is going to be based on, uh, on a joint work with Miguel Paolos, van, um, Bout van Rees, Bertrand Ozan, and uh, a couple of papers I wrote with Conor Bichon, Leonardo Rastelli, and again Bertrand Ozan, who is my student. So for me, for me personally, uh, the way uh, to think about CFTs yeah, is just as a bunch of local operators. So we have some oper local operators, O, I, of X. And these operators are characterized by, by what? By their scaling dimension, delta I. <coughs> and by some other labels. Uh, so by their spin, which is SOD representation. So we are in D dimensions. And then maybe by some representation of, uh, of global symmetry group. And so uh, given these local operators, the observables that, that we consider are correlation functions, uh, endpoint functions of these operators. And then the fact that we have a conformal field theory just means that if we take uh, a conformal transformation which maps uh, axis to x primes, and by the way, in this talk, I'm only going to be considering a finite dimensional uh, so-called global conformal group SD plus 1 comma 1, uh, which has finitely many generators, so which has uh, Poincaré generators P mu, <coughs> M mu mu, and also the rotation generator D, and the special conformal generators K mu, finitely many. So uh, if we have a conformal transformation of this type, which maps x to x primes, then this correlation function G at the points x1 prime, let me like write xi prime, is related to the, to the same correlation function evaluated at, at the points xi by some local factors, f of x1, f of xn. I'm, go I'm not going to write down these factors. They are well known. But uh, the, the important point is that they are, they are uh, local. They depend only on x1, xn. They depend on the dimensions of the operators in the correlation function, and they're completely fixed by, by group theory, by, uh, by the fact that we are dealing with the group SOD plus 1, comma 1. So that's, in a nutshell, what a conformal field theory is. So we just have a bunch of correlation functions, and they correlation functions at x and x primes are related according to this rule. And uh, so why, why these CFTs are important to physics? Because um, they actually emerge extremely frequently uh, as endpoints of formalization group flows. So if we have some UV theory, and this UV theory is uh, some sort of local theory. Maybe it's described by some local Lagrangian, or maybe it's uh, defined as a lattice model with some uh, finite range interactions. So if we now take an RG flow and uh, uh, we flow to a fixed point, let's suppose that we flow uh, to a fixed point. So since it's a fixed point, it has scale invariance. And then 
the amazing fact is that this scale invariance is typically going to be enhanced to a conformal to conformal invariance. So we're going to have uh, CFT in the infrared. And so, uh, so this is the typical situation which, which arises uh, when we have a local theory in the UV. And since I'm going to be focusing on the second part of my talk on non-local CFTs, I think it helps uh, to recall why, you know, how do we understand that in such a situation uh, conformal symmetry emerges so that, that later on we will be uh, we will appreciate more that sometimes it emerges even when you don't have a local description. So to, to contrast these two situations. And, and so, so by the way, can you see it when, when I write it down here? Should I, should I like not, not write below this? Okay. So, so why? why? Why in the local cases we get conformal invariance? Well, this is intimately related to the existence of a local uh, conserved stress tensor operator. So this is uh, typically the answer. So the fact that this uh, local stress tensor operator exists, it's basically a consequence of having some local description in the UV. So we have a local the standard operator which satisfies certain properties, okay, it's conserved, d mu t mu nu is equal to zero. It has a uh, scaling dimension equal to the space-time dimension. And uh, it's <coughs> traceless. Well, this tracelessness condition should not be taken uh, automatic, uh, should not be taken automatically for granted, but I will say a few words about why this tracelessness condition appears. But if we assume that this tracelessness condition holds, then the way conformal we argue for conformal invariance is as follows. We say that, you know, by definition, this stress tensor operator, it describes the change of the action of the theory under some, conf under some coordinate transformation, delta x mu equals epsilon mu of x. So we have delta s equals t mu nu uh, d mu epsilon nu up to some proportionality factor. And then uh, the vector fields corresponding to conformal transformations, they satisfy the conformal killing equation. So del, del nu epsilon nu uh, symmetrized is proportional to delta mu nu times the divergence. And so if you plug this in, and if you use the tracelessness, then uh, we get that uh, the action is invariant under infinitesimal conformal transformations. And from this, everything follows. You can construct the, the conformal charges by integrating the, the stress tensor with respect to this uh, conformal killing vector fields. So you, you, you construct char charge Q by integrating uh, t mu nu over some closed surface, and so on. So I have to say a few words about this tracelessness condition. So uh, this uh, tracelessness condition is not automatic. Uh, and in fact, uh, if we only know that we have a fixed point of RG flow, and the fixed point means that the theory is scale invariant, a theory could might, might have as well been scale invariant if instead of this tracelessness condition, we had a condition t mu nu <coughs> equals a divergence of some vector, of some vector field. So this is enough for scale invariance. And the way I personally understand why this does not happen is because uh, if you have a strongly coupled uh, situation, if you have a strongly coupled RG flow, well, actually not necessarily strongly coupled, any interacting RG flow. So for this condition to hold, V lambda has to be 
a vector operator of dimension d minus 1 because the stress tether has dimension d and moreover you know it has to be not conserved because if, if it's conserved then we go back to this equation so uh, basically it's a question about genericity you say that in any interacting situation there's not going to be a vector operator which has dimension exactly d minus 1 and so this genericity guarantees that all interacting RG flows that I know of, they actually is conformally invariant. Uh, but if you take Gaussian RG flows, then sure, some Gaussian RG flows exist where there is a vector operator which has dimension d minus 1. Uh, well, not RG flows, just Gaussian theories. And they have scale invariance without conformal invariance. So, so scale invariance implies conformal invariance under the condition of genericity of interactions. Uh, okay, so uh, any questions? So this is a, um, a well-known story, it's a rather well-known story, and I will call for the purposes of this talk, it's, it's actually a standard terminology in a certain community, uh, by a local CFT it's a, by definition local CFT is a CFT which has T menu. So it has T menu and the conformal algebra, the generators of conformal algebra in this theory are given by integrals of T menu. So this is the definition of non of local CFT. A non local CFT will be a theory which is satisfies all axioms of CFT. So it has local operators. Those op local operators, they have correlation functions. Correlation functions are conformally invariant. So there is an algebra of conformal generators. Moreover, uh, the local operators satisfy OP, if you are familiar with, conformal block decomposition, all other axioms. The only axiom which is not satisfied is that there is no T menu. There's no locally conserved spin 2 primary operator uh, which has dimension D. So this, this we will call a non-local CFT. Um, I can assume unitarity. Yeah. Uh, are you referring to logarithmic uh, situations yeah, or not necessarily? It's just local theories. Yeah. Well, I mean, there are some cases like you're describing, but since I'm not, I don't want to go, I want to emphasize a different, uh, yeah. slightly different uh, phenomena. So, so, so we can focus on unitary theories to, to avoid intersection with those phenomena that you're describing. So let's focus on the unitary theories. Then uh, we, have, uh, we have unitary conformal theories, two-point function is diagonal, there are no logarithmic partners, but there is no local T menu. And there is no way to edit. There's no way to make one. There's no, there's no way to make one. So, uh, no t menu at all but uh, typically if you don't have t menu which is a primary then okay t menu has to be descendant but is descendant of of whom so in a again so t menu is a very special field so the fact that it has dimension d and so on okay if if you have such a field in the uv it's going to be preserved in the ir if you don't have it in the uv it's not like just going to emerge in there out of nowhere even as a descendant, so. 
uh, okay so uh, so logically this is possible we have we can have conformal algebra we can have charges of the conformal algebra which act on local operators but these charges are not given by an integral of uh, of a local spin to operator so logically this is possible uh, but it's nevertheless uh, perhaps uh, paradoxical that such theories play any role. Because you could think, you know, given that the argument I gave you for the emergence of conformal invariance at the fixed points of RG flows was so much based on the existence of T mu nu, you might say, well, I mean, you can define them local CFTs, as theories not no T mu, but there are going to be no such theories. So this may be, perhaps this is an empty class or a class of theories which have, have no importance for physics. And so what I would like to, uh, to, to, to say that no, well, actually, as a matter of fact, there are some non-local CFTs which play a uh, role in describing phenomena. And uh, I would like to give you a few examples. That's the, pur the purpose of today's talk. And um, to begin with, I will give you a very simple example of how non-local CFTs can emerge, which probably many people are familiar with. And then I will discuss some more weird examples. So the simplest example uh, is the case of boundary or defect CFTs. So this is going to be example one. So uh, this appears as follows. You take a local CFT which leaves, say, just cons considering one example, let's take a local CFT which lives in d plus 1 dimensions. And then instead of considering it in full space, we are going to consider it in a half space. So we, which is defined by the condition xd plus 1 positive. So it lives here. So this d plus 1 dimensional CFT, it has local operators. Let me take one just one such local operator uh, or delta, and okay, I am going to take it as a function of uh, d directions, which I will call xi, and the d plus first direction, and then I'm going to take a limit. Yeah. So when I uh, I forgot to say something. So when I put a, a CFT in d in uh, in the situation with boundary, I have to specify a boundary condition. So you can think about it um, in terms of a microscopic description. So if this CFT appeared as an infrared limit of some lattice model, for example, then okay, that lattice model had some natural set of boundary conditions. For example, we had a three-dimensional easing model, and in the three-dimensional easing model, we put it in a half space, and maybe we specified three boundary conditions on the boundary, or maybe we specified uh, instead of taking three boundary conditions, we could have specified, um, we could have turned on a magnetic field on the boundary. So we would break the two invariants on the boundary, but not in the bulk. So different boundary conditions will, will correspond to different d-dimensional theories I'm going to get. But let's just fix, for definiteness, let's think of three-dimensional easing model with three boundary conditions. So going back here, we took an operator or delta, and then we take a limit when x d plus 1 approaches the boundary. And so in this limit, uh, we will have you know, up to some singular power-like factor, which I'm not going to write for this discussion. Uh, the operator or delta is going to approach an operator which I will call O hat, which lives on the boundary. 
and depends only on the boundary coordinates xi. The dimension of this operator o hat, which I denoted delta hat, is a new parameter of the theory. So you could not, it's not simply related to the dimension of the operator or delta. So it depends on the boundary conditions in particular that you chose. But the point is that for every operator delta, we can define a corresponding operator or hat with dimension delta hat. Now let us look at correlation functions of these or hat operators in d dimensions. What do you mean by linear combination? Well, like a bell boundary operator doesn't make sense. So, so the, the leading term shows bell comparison. You mean there's going to be the leading term and then there's going to be subleading terms? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, in, in general, what I'm saying is that by taking the OP, you will discover that there, there are some infinitely many operators living on the boundary. So let me let me. So, so what you want to say is that there's going to be in general some. I take, for example, this for, for this operator, this guy is going to be the the most singular one. But there are going to be subleading terms, so you discover more operators. What I would like to focus. Uh, this this example is not going to be the main focus of of my talk. So let me just describe it briefly. This example is a bit trivial. So what I'm, what I'm trying to say here is that we are going to have these operators living on the boundary. Now I'm going to consider correlation functions of the operators on the boundary in isolation. You know, just somebody gives you d-dimensional correlation functions of these operators or hat and doesn't tell you that they came from a CFT in d plus 1 dimensions. Then uh, the correlation functions of these operators in d-dimensions are going to satisfy all axioms of conformal field theory, of d-dimensional conformal field theory. They're going to be conformally invariant. Uh, they're going to have OPE, d-dimensional OPE. They're going to have d-dimensional conformal block decomposition. The only axiom they will not satisfy is that there's going to be no d-dimensional stress tensor in this case. So there was a d plus 1 dimensional stress tensor, but there's going to be no d-dimensional stress tensor. And so, uh, and it's clear why there's going to be no d-dimensional stress tensor, because this theory, this d-dimensional theory, it, well, it's not a complete theory. You know, in a sense, I, I'm, I'm cheating because it's not a full theory. The full theory, was a, the, the full theory arguably was the d, d plus 1 dimensional one, and this is just a subset. This is just a subsector of the theory. And so that subsector by itself does not have a conserved stress tensor operator. So uh, through this mechanism, you can uh, generate many, many non-local conformal field theories. Uh, and this is certainly not surprising. Uh, what is uh, more surprising is going to be my second example, because now I would like to uh, focus on theories, which are like this. So this, the, the feature of this theory is that the theory in d, d, d dimensions was not a full theory. It was a subset. Now I would like to consider more surprising examples, which are going to be still non-local CFTs. But arguably, the, these theories are going to be complete theories, complete d-dimensional theories, and not subsets of some other theory. So that's, that's <coughs> a, bit, a bit more surprising. Uh, if somebody just gave you the d-dimensional one. Yeah, that's, uh, uh, that's, uh, that's an interesting question. Yeah, in this case, in the case of the, uh, of the boundary theory, uh, there, are, there are some, um, there are some diagnostics. So these theories which appear, uh, these boundary theories, they contain one 
special operator, which is called the displacement operator, which corresponds to the possibility of uh, uh, deforming this boundary a little bit. So the theory which lives on the boundary, it knows that it came from a, from a bulk CFT, because it contains this, this scalar displacement operator, which actually appears, so the, the, stress, the stress tensor, the bulk stress tensor, it's conserved in the bulk, but then on the boundary, its divergence has a delta function contribution proportional to this displacement operator. So if you have a, a d-dimensional theory, which does not have a stress tensor operator, but contains this scalar with the right dimensions to play the role of the displacement operator, you might suspect that it actually came from a, as a subset. But the theory on the boundary, All, all bootstrap axioms. It can be studied in isolation using the bootstrap. But then it doesn't really matter. It's, it's a perfectly fine theory. It's, it's, just it's a perfectly fine theory. Uh, and what, what I'm trying to emphasize here is that it's not surprising in this case that it's so that it's conformal. It's non local and conformal. And it's not surprising because actually it's local. It can be completed into d plus one dimensional local theory, if only you could do it. So let's, let's look at the second example. The second example is going to be, uh, in a sense, even more trivial, but then we will complicate it a bit. But arguably, it's a, it has the feature that it's by itself a d-dimensional, complete d-dimensional theory. So. Uh, this example is something which is uh, called uh, as mean field theory. And sometimes it's also called generalized uh, free field. So uh, the, it's defined, this, this CFT is defined as follows. You take one field, phi, and we assign to this field a two-point function appropriate for a scalar field of dimension delta phi. So this is just like an any CFT. But now uh, we define this, all the rest of the theory uh, is Gaussian. So all higher point functions of this field phi are defined to be disconnected. So for example, we take uh, the, the four point function of field phi at four different points. And this is just one, two, three, four plus permutations. Three plus two other permutations. So it's a not only boring theory. So the, so far, the only difference from free massless scalar theory is that delta phi is a free parameter. So I can choose delta phi, I can choose delta phi to be any number, uh, and if I want it to be unitary, I should choose it uh, larger than or equal than d minus two over two. But otherwise, it's a, it's a free parameter. <coughs> so. Um, OK, well, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a boring theory, but also the free scalar is a boring theory. We're going to complicate it in a second. But what I would like to, um, to emphasize is that it's a CFT. So this theory is a conformal field theory. So here I defined it in terms of this operator phi, which plays a special role. But taking OPEs, of phi with itself, you can discover uh, the full spectrum of this theory. You can discover other primary operators. So you take, for example, this four-point function defined by this formula. You can take its conform work decomposition. And in this conform work decomposition, you will discover other fields which exist in this theory. So, and since it's a Gaussian theory, we can give these fields names. So for example, you, can, you will discover a field uh, 
which is schematically of the form phi box to some power m, and then some number of derivatives acting on phi. So this is going to be a field of dimension uh, delta equals 2 delta phi plus uh, 2m plus l. And it's going to have a spin l. So this field you discover by taking the OP of phi with itself. Then you can take further the OPEs of these fields, and you discover more and more fields. So this, this theory has infinitely many operators, primary operators. Uh, but what I would like to, uh, to say is that this theory is not going to contain a stress tensor operator, a local stress tensor operator. So you, it has infinitely many operators, but among them, there is no local stress tensor operator. Yes. Uh, okay, let, let, let me uh, let me address this in a second. But uh, uh, no, you cannot add it. Mm, you cannot add it because, uh, and the short answer is that uh, there are void identities which tell you that in a local theory, if theory is local, then the OP phi times phi always contains T mu. Because the because the, the three point function phi phi t mu is fixed by the word identity, the prefactor in this three point function, and so if you take the p of phi phi and you don't discover t mu, well, it means there is no t mu. Are you happy with this argument? Okay. So th this, uh, so this three-point function, it's proportional to uh, delta delta phi divided by the center of charge. So it's. Uh, so, um, but okay, uh, I. I guess if you're not convinced, you have to trust me. But, but the, the argument is that, OK, you take this. At least it's clear that there is no operator with quantum numbers appropriate for the stress tensor. Because okay, stress tensor has spin 2, and then delta has to be equal to d. So uh, it's clear that in this range, when delta phi is, is strictly larger than d minus 2 over 2, of course, if it's equal to d minus 2 over 2, then we just have free, free massless scalar, and there is a stress tensor. Otherwise. Uh, there is no uh, there is no operator with dimension and spin appropriate for the local stress tensor operator, and so um, so what can you do with that? Well, well, this is then uh, a non-local CFT, and there are. Uh, several ways, so we will call it non-local CFT because it does not have a local tensor operator. But you can also see that it's non-local in a more pedestrian way for this particular theory. So for example, you could, uh, if you wish, you could describe this theory by a non-local action. And this non-local action will have the form uh, integral phi uh, box to some power, let me call it gamma phi d dx. So you can, it's a Gaussian theory. So it's, as, as is appropriate for a Gaussian theory, we should be able to find a quadratic action. And by choosing appropriate pa fractional power of the Laplacian, you can, uh, you can make the field phi to have this dimensional delta phi. And then you can say that this action describes the theory. So you could say, well, uh, some people also ask, well, if you have an action, why can't I describe the stress tensor 
just by varying, you know, somehow covariantizing this action, coupling it to the metric, and then defining the stress tensor by varying respect to the metric. Well, the uh, the answer is that you will you could do that, but you will not get a local uh, you will not get a local operator out of this procedure for, because if you covariantize a non-local action, you start varying the operator you will get is going to be non-local. Yes. So, so there, there is a. There must be a set of then that files for which it's distributed. Yes. Yes. If you could took, you could take, uh, you could generalize it to gamma equal. Uh, the usual case is gamma equal to one, the local. But you can generalize it to gamma equal two, and so on. They are going to be. They are going to have phi below the unitarity bound. Since you asked me to restrict to unitary theories, uh, I actually have it in my notes, but I excluded it by your demand. So, uh, OK, uh, this theory is conformal in spite of being non-local. And how, uh, how can we understand this fact? You know, why, why, why the hell is it conformal? There, is, there are two ways uh, to uh, explain this. Depending whether you like idea CFT or not, you will prefer one of the two ways. So let me start for, for Monica with the first way. So the first way to understand why it's conformal is through ADS-CFT, but uh, through a somewhat, uh, OK, let, let me describe, let me just describe. So it's, it's very simple. In ADS-CFT, we can consider uh, a d plus 1 dimensional ADS. And in the bulk, we put a, f <coughs> uh, a, massless, a massive scalar field of certain mass m. OK, we, we keep an ADS radius r. And then on the boundary, we are going to have a field phi of dimension delta phi equals <coughs> d over 2 plus uh, square root d over 2 squared <coughs> plus m r squared. You know, by playing with boundary conditions, you can also realize the other sign. But let me focus on this standard case. So by varying, uh, by varying the mass, we can reproduce basically any value of delta phi. Uh, by value the, the product MR, we can reproduce any value of delta phi, which is consistent with the entirety bound. And uh, the theory in the bulk is Gaussian. So the theory on the boundary that you get is going to be Gaussian. Uh, since it's ADS-CFT, it guarantees that the theory on the boundary is going to be conformal. And uh, unlike in the most standard version of ADS-CFT, I insist in this exercise on keeping the metric in the bulk fixed as opposed to varying it. So I decouple gravity in the bulk. And when I do this, the theory on the boundary does not contain. So when I do this, I, I achieve two things. First of all, I make my theory UV complete because I, you know all the problems uh, with UV completeness come from gravity. And but also at the same time, I lose the stress tensor operator because in ADS CFT, the stress tensor couples to the graviton in the bulk. If, if I don't have any gravitons in the bulk, I have no stress tensor on the boundary. So this explains why the boundary theory in this limit uh, is going to be non-local, as I said. So that's, that's the first explanation. And uh, you, can, uh, you can see that, again, I explained the conformality of this non-local theory by going to some uh, high dimensional description. So you can ask, what is the difference between this example and this example? 
the example with the boundary safeties? Well, because arguably, in, in this case, this is just a rewriting of the theory. So uh, in no way the theory on the boundary and the theory in the bulk contain, uh, I mean, the theory in the boundary and the theory in the bulk are completely equivalent. They contain exactly the same amount of information, which was not the case in the, in the first example. So this was the first explanation. But for me, this is not my favorite explanation, actually. My favorite explanation is the second one. And this is going to, get to, lead, to lead us to some interesting physics later on. Uh, this is known as uh, caffarelli Silvestri trick. And uh, it's actually simpler than, <laughs> much simpler than, than a DCFT explanation. So, uh, so I said that delta phi is larger than d minus 2 over 2. Let me pick formally uh, some dimension d, big D, which is larger than d, such that delta phi is equal to big D minus 2 divided by 2. In general, big D is a, is a non-integer number of dimensions. And then I'm going to do the following trick. I'm going to consider in the d-dimensional space, I'm going to consider a massless scalar field, which was unlike in ADS where I considered a massive scalar. So I'm going to consider a massless scalar in big D dimensions. This massless scalar in big D dimensions is conformally invariant. It has this dimension. And then I'm going to restrict it to a d to a small d-dimensional subspace in this big d-dimensional flat, completely flat bulk. So if I do this restriction, then clearly the theory which is restricted is conformally invariant. So the, the big theory was conformally invariant. I restricted the conformal subgroup of the subspace is just a subgroup of the big conformal group. It's conformally invariant. So, uh, so really your example is some sort of analytic continuation of local TFT. The other one. I like the I like the the way that you say analytic continuation because this is going to be one of my uh, one of my points. So uh, indeed, as we will see. Uh, as you will see in, um, in a short while, uh, one of the points that I would like to make is that uh, while local CFTs, local unitary CFTs, typically they come in isolated points, you know, unless you have some supersymmetry or some other special things like C equal 1 and 2D, uh, non-local CFTs are much more ubiquitous. They easily form continuous families. So here I have one continuous family of uh, non-local CFTs, which depends on this free parameter delta phi. These are Gaussian non-local CFTs, boring ones. But now I'm going to this very easily. I'm going to complicate this and turn this into non-Gaussian non-local CFTs. Yes. Is there a way to see this with like entanglement entropy or something? Because somehow it seems like, at least in, you have to find these surfaces that go into the bulk that give you the entanglement entropy, which seems like the locality is reaching in, in through the bulk. But, and also, I guess, if you just have a system and you compute the entropy, if it's local, it's some kind of minimal, some, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I, I, th I think for this non-local CFTs, uh, many of the methods based on the using entanglement entropy just don't apply, so. Or rather, to apply them, indeed, you have to come up with this extension into the local bulk, whatever it is. OK, how am I doing time boys? Yeah, that's good. Uh, so OK, uh, then I'll, um, I would like now to, to talk about this, uh, my favorite physical non-local safety. which is the long-range easing model, 
or rather the physical system which leads to the non-local CFTs. So why should we, why should physicists care about non-local CFTs? So let's take, let me define the long-range easing model. Long-range easing model is a lattice model. You can do it in, in any number of dimensions d. Uh, so you take, say, cubic lattice, and you define uh, the Hamiltonian. It's a statistical mechanical model. You define the Hamiltonian like in the easing model, except that you sum not over nearest neighbors, but you sum over all uh, pairs of spins, and you weight them by the weight i minus j to some power. <coughs> and it's conventional to, to pick this power d plus s, where s has to be a positive number to have well-defined thermodynamics. And this si are just like in the easy model, they are plus or minus 1. <coughs> so uh, so this, is a, this is a curious model of statistical mechanics which um, has been studied you know, for 40 years. And uh, you know, I'm not going to give references since I don't have much time, but you can find them in my papers. It goes back to Fisher in the 70s and, uh, and to, to Dyson, actually, in the 60s. So the, uh, the case d equal 1 is a bit special. And the case d4 and larger is, is trivial for reasons that I quite the same as for the easing. So let me focus on the case d equal 2 and 3, where, which are quite similar. Uh, and in this case, when we vary this parameter s, so for every value of this parameter s, this model has a second order phase transition at some critical temperature. And I'm interested in describing uh, the physics of the second order phase transition. So what I would like, uh, what I claim is that this second order phase transition is described by a non-local CFT. This non-local CFT is going to be non-local because my lattice model does not have a nearest neighbor of finite range interaction, so it's not going to give rise to a local stress tensor operator. And so this is, this is the, the model that many people studied, and I also studied in recent years. It has a very interesting phase diagram. So let me, let me explain briefly what the phase diagram is as a function of s. So actually, if you vary s, uh, from 0 up to a certain critical value. Uh, no, actually, here is going to be not enough space. Let me. So from 0 to some critical value which is equal to d over 2. So in this range, the model actually is described, the critical point is described by mean field theory, so the boring Gaussian critical point. And this mean field theory, uh, you, you write it just by a naive continuum limit of this lattice model. So you're, you write uh, the naive continuous limit action as equals integral phi of x, phi of y, uh, x minus y to the d plus s. And if you, so th this kernel here is just a fraction of Laplacian. So you can write it as integral phi uh, Laplacian s over 2 phi. And so the field phi then has a dimension uh, equals d minus s over 2. Boring. Now, uh, then there is another critical value, which is called S star. So that if you exceed, uh, I'm going to talk about this range later, but if you exceed this S star, then the theory, the critical point also simplifies. It actually factor factorizes into two theories. So in this range, when S is larger than S star, the critical point is the same as the short range easing critical point 
plus uh, mean field theory of a field chi, of another field chi, which actually has dimension d plus s over 2. So you see, this is interesting. Because uh, first of all, why is it it's, it's natural to expect that if s is very large, then the universality class of this model has to actually approach the short range Ising universality class. Because if s becomes larger and larger, then the interaction becomes more and more picked at short distances. And you can expect that in the end, you should get to the short range Ising universality class. That's what you get. But with an important twist, the model the, you, the lattice model is non-local, so the, the, the critical point cannot be local theory. But in this case, all non-locality is concentrated in this completely decoupled mean field theory sector described by the field chi. So this is uh, a twist, but nevertheless, the theory is relatively simple. What happens here? Well, here, in this range, uh, the critical point is defined, is described by some non-local and non-Gaussian CFT. So not much is known about this CFT, except for uh, two limits. So you can make, you can do computations in this range and you can do computations in this range. So in these two limits, this non-local non Gaussian CFT allows a weakly coupled description. And to see why this is the case, it's, uh, let me explain what is the origin of these two uh, critical values, d over 2 and s star. So it's actually, d over 2 is, is quite, uh, is quite um, easy to understand. So what happens when s becomes d over 2? You can see it from here, delta phi is equal to d minus s over 2. So in this, at this point, delta phi becomes equal to d over 4. And so when delta phi is d over 4, the operator of phi to the fourth is marginal. So that's why the theory was Gaussian here, because the operator of phi to the fourth was irrelevant, and you could not perturb this theory. It was a stable fixed point. So here, the operator of phi to the fourth becomes weakly relevant, you can add it to the, to the theory, you can flow. And by doing this flow, you, you, fl you flow to this non-local, non-Gaussian CFT. So this explains the origin of this d over 2 limit. Here, uh, there is also an operator which becomes marginal. So this operator is the product of the spin field of the Ising model sigma and this mean field theory field chi. So this operator becomes marginal precisely at the point S star. And this determines the location of a star. So S star uh, is equal to 2 minus uh, eta in the short range Ising universality class. And so if s is slightly below s star, you can take these two theories, these two decoupled theories, short range easing and the non local mean field theory. You can couple them by the sigma chi operator. You arrange a flow, and you flow to the non local non Gaussian CFT. So we have this amazing picture. Well, it was amazing to me when I first realized that it's true. So we have a family of mean field theories. Do it on top. And on bottom, we have this theory short range easing plus chi. So when we cross uh, d over 2, you have a line of fixed points which you ray, which you which you, uh, to which you flow by adding the operator phi to the fourth. Here, we have a line of fixed points to which you flow by adding the operator sigma chi. But these are the same fixed points. So in, uh, in high energy physics, this situation where we can reach the same fixed point 
by flowing from two different UV descriptions is called infrared duality. And usually infrared duality, in examples that, that are mostly studied, uh, this is the realm of supersymmetric theories. Here we have a non-supersymmetric and even non-local situation. And we have the same, uh, we have the same uh, fixed point. It has two UV descriptions. When one UV description is weakly coupled, the other one is very strongly coupled, and vice versa. So it's a beautiful example of filtratic infrared duality. Uh, no, no, there is there is plenty of evidence. I don't have time to describe it all now. It's very striking that the two theories, SRI and MFT, are critical exactly at the same temperature. Right? Because physical variable is, of course, temperature, which you are talking because so you're varying the temperature, and at some point your model is critical. I'm not claiming here that, uh, so by this SRI, I'm not referring to the lattice model is coming sorry, I'm, I'm describing the CFT. So it does not have to be critical at the same temperature. Well, the two SRI and CHI. And I'm, I'm saying, so th this theory, the, the latest model here, it has, uh, it is critical at a certain temperature. And I'm saying that this critical point yeah. can be reached. You can now reach it, you can reach it from three different UV descriptions. You can reach it from the latest model you can reach it from the Gaussian theory per turn by phi to the fourth. And you can reach it from the short range easing CFT. So you already put you already put your short range easing to the critical temperature, perturbed by this sigma chi perturbation. And then I claim you will flow to the same critical point. Yeah, I understood the field theory part. Yeah. Well, at least up, it, at least up to s equal two. Well, it's uh, uh, so the evidence uh, is um, RG. Well, RG usual RG reasoning uh, universality. Uh, there is this picture that I described, and then there is another uh, important piece of evidence which I d do not have time to describe. It's a certain non-renormalization type theorem. Namely, that the dimension of phi is uh, is completely fixed in uh, in these theories, and and this normalization theorem agrees. You see it both from. You c you can see it in all UV descriptions, and so this is the evidence that they all they all match up. So I'm uh, I'm probably starting to run out of time. Uh, but I'll just draw one, one uh, last schematic plot, which I think is instructive. So as I said, uh, not much is known about this non-local CFTs, but I'm describing the long-range easing. But I hope that uh, just like the short-range easing, it can be studied using the, 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 the bootstrap. And it's interesting. Uh, to see what changes from the point of view of the bootstrap when you study this theory as opposed to the short range easing CFT. So, uh, I don't know, by, by now probably many people uh, are familiar with the basic story, bootstrap story for the short range easing when you have two operators, okay, you can call them phi and phi squared. And these are two, the only two relevant uh, scalar operators in the short range easing model. And then you get an island. So that's something that probably people are familiar with. So the difference for the long range easing model from this story is that long range easing model actually contains not one uh, primary Z2 order operator phi, but two operators. Namely, it contains operators phi uh, and phi cube are both primary in the long-range easing model. 
And moreover, their dimensions are related by this curious shadow-like relation that delta phi plus delta phi cube is exactly equal to d. This is the, uh, the non-renormalization theorem that I was mentioning. So this is very different from the short-range Ising model. Because in the shortage, as you know, phi, phi cube is not a primary operator, but it's a descendant of phi. So in the short range easing, phi cube is box phi, roughly speaking. And so when we study this long range easing more using the bootstrap, then we have to relax the assumption of one z to odd scalar operator. And that assumption was crucial for getting the island. So if you relax that assumption, then, you know, so this is some unpublished work of Conor Behan. This island, uh, it kind of uh, expands into a sort of wedge, which finishes at the island. And so the long range easing model, it, it corresponds to some line in, inside this wedge. And so far, it, it has not been possible to to window down this wedge sufficiently narrowly so that it describes the full line. But nevertheless, it, it shows uh, one of the points that I already mentioned, that uh, when we have easing model, the easing model is an isolated CFT. Now we can uh, extend this easing model into a whole family of CFTs if we abandon the assumption of locality. So we get this uh, non-local long-range easing model theories. Sorry, one more question. I, I yeah. How do you know it's a CFT anyway? Uh, good question. Uh, numerics? No, no, not not numerics at all. Uh, numerically, it's it's very hard to uh, to study this. Um, well, actually, when I got first interested in this theory. I got interested in it because I thought that uh, since it's non-local, it should not be a CFT. And so I thought, oh, fantastic. Now I'm going to show that this theory is not, is not conformal. So I, I did some calculations in the epsilon expansion. And all things that I was computing were, found, were consistent with conform variance. And I thought, OK, well, this, this is strange. And then the argument that I found for the conformal invariance is actually uh, it's, it's, uh, it's based on the caffarelli Sylvester trick. So we can extend this theory into d-dimensional theory in flat space. And then we just add the interaction on the line. And since the local theory, uh, d-dimensional theory, has a stress tensor, you can argue that uh, the RG flow will, so at least in perturbation theory, you can argue that. So non perturbative I don't think there is a proof. Uh, OK, well, uh, I had some comments. You know, to, to close the circle, I would have to, uh, you know, like if, if I were like to completely close the circle, I would need still like three, four minutes. I mean, you had time to several questions. OK. OK, that's going to make uh, for a nice uh, finish, and it's going to please Monica as well. So uh, uh, let me connect this to, um, to ADS-CFT. So uh, the message that I would like to connect to, to ADS-CFT is this message that we have, we expect to have families uh, continuous families very easily. We expect to find very easily continuous families of uh, non-local CFTs. So from this picture, from coupling a local theory to mean field theory, it's clear. Uh, but it also has a counterpart in ADS CFT. So let me describe it. So let me go back to ADS bulk with some radius r. And now, instead of putting in the bulk a Gaussian theory, a free massive scalar theory, so I still keep the metric in the bulk fixed, so no gravity in the bulk. But 
the th I changed the field theory which I put on the bulk. I put now here in the, in the bulk any uh, d plus 1 dimensional UV complete <coughs> local theory, which may be massive, maybe massless. Well, let me take a massive theory. Let me take something like QCD, say in d plus 1 dimensions, or, you know, some UV complete free scalar theory, or not free, uh, interacting, interacting theory. So I'm just putting here some interacting um, massive theory. And this theory is going to have some massive scale, mass scale. Let me call this scale, I don't know, for, for the purposes of this discussion, lambda QCD. Uh, and now let me look at the boundary. So what is going to be the theory on the boundary? Well, it's going to be conformal because the conformality is guaranteed by the whole, you know, no matter which theory I put in the bulk, since the bulk is uh, invariant under the conformal group, the boundary theory is going to be conformal, conformally invariant. Uh, it's going to be uh, non-local for the same reason as for the, ma for the free uh, massive theory, uh, because the gravity in the bulk is decoupled. And the, uh, all the scaling dimensions of operators on the boundary theory uh, are going to depend, are going to be functions of dimen dimension f dimensionless product uh, lambda QCD times R. So by varying, by varying, by keeping lambda QCD fixed, or by varying the radius, I'm going to generate on the boundary uh, a continuous family of uh, non-local CFTs. And uh, this just shows how easily it is to get non-local CFTs from the ADS CFT point of view. And as long as you abandon uh, gravity in the bulk. And so this, uh, this idea, uh, it's, uh, it's been used recently uh, in a beautiful work by uh, Miguel Paolos, uh, Joao Penedones, John Toledo, Walt van Rees, and Pedro Vieira. in 2016. So they, they use this. Since, since the theory on the boundary can be studied using the bootstrap, they try to use this idea to learn something about strongly coupled massive theories in the bulk. But then if you take the limit when r goes to infinity, if you try to take the limit when r goes to infinity, you can hope also to learn something about uh, the massive theories in flat space. So that was their idea. And they had some uh, important results in this direction. OK, so well, this uh, closes the circle. And I think this is a good place to stop. the long-range easing? Uh, well, it, uh, you can try to give it uh, a bulk interpretation, idea safety interpretation. But you see, unlike in this example that uh, Miguel and, uh, and uh, his friends studied, uh, here uh, I have uh, Ethereum in the bulk, and I add interactions in the bulk. If I were to, to put my long-range easing theory in, in ADS-CFT, Procrust bed, then uh, I would have, you know, I would have this beautiful bulk, which would be a free massive theory, but I would still have to add interactions on the boundary. No, I, I, I would have to add interactions on the boundary, not on the bulk. And this 
by the way, this explains this non-renormalization theory. Since all interactions live on the boundary, this explains why the dimension of phi does not get renormalized. But this also shows that this description is not particularly useful for the, for the long range easing model. You don't gain much. So you can consider it, but from it's not useful for doing calculations. Unlike in, in this case. In this case, it's, uh, it's much more useful. It's, yeah, indeed, it's, uh, we, we thought a lot about this because it was one of the major puzzles that, that, uh, that I tried to resolve and I hope that we got some insight into it because, if, because we're trying to understand what happens with this. Suppose that this, this looks like it's non-local. It definitely starts here non-local because mean field theory is non-local. You perturb it a bit, all operators get dimension, but this stress tensor it was way, uh, the, the candidate for the stress tensor, the lower spin two operator, it was way above the conserved dimension, D. It just gets corrected to bit, so there's still no operator. So it's clear here. But then uh, it was interesting to happen. Here, uh, the, the short range easing definitely has a, a local stress tensor operator. So how does this local stress tensor operator of short range easing emerges in the limit when S goes to a star? This was very interesting. Or vice versa, how this uh, operator, uh, which is conserved, becomes non-conserved on this side. So this is very interesting because this is, uh, in conformal field theories, operators can get lifted from conservation only by means uh, of a Higgs mechanism. So the, the, the total number of states is conserved. So the, the operator which is conserved has fewer states than the operator which is not conserved. So in order to get these states, it has to eat someone, sort of Higgs mechanism. And uh, the presence of this mean field theory sector, it allows to construct uh, an operator which provides the missing states. So T mu nu in the short range easing eats these extra states and becomes non conserved here. So we computed its dimension in, uh, in perturbation theory, and you see that it does get the anomalous dimension. So it all matches, it all matches nicely.